Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey and this is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number 25. Um, if you're here right now, that means you're a major early bird and or you are watching the recording. Uh, I want to remind you guys that uh, the best place to find us and follow us is on Twitter. We are at Shot Science on there. Uh, we are also on Facebook and Google Plus. We are Shot Science in those places. And also, of course, watch our YouTube videos. Uh, we are Shot Science there, and that's where we have tutorials on all things basketball, um, you know, drills, defense, shooting, um, you know, everything that you could want on basketball. Just check us out there. Um, let's see. So before we get into questions, we're going to actually have uh, a little uh, talk on a topic that we brought today. And uh, if you guys want to start sending your questions in, the best place to hit us up is on Twitter. Uh, we will try to get into the chat a little bit. Uh, that usually gets a little bit crazy, but the best option is Twitter. All right, so uh, let's get into our first little topic here. Okay, one of the things that, that uh, I wanted to talk about today is individual and team defense and some of the things that make it uh, important uh, and also uh, things that players do that make, it, um, make the defense kind of weak, uh, have weak links in it. Uh, one of the things that happens in, in basketball, uh, and I think it's probably more of, of the uh, more prevalent in, in boys or men's basketball, and that is the fact that uh, guys have such an ego uh, on defense about being beat. Uh, they don't like for an offensive player to go by them, and so they try to try to protect themselves from that. That's a real damaging thing for their ego to allow that to happen. And so what they try to do then is to play that uh, uh, offensive player softer so they have more time to react and stay with that person. And this creates problems uh, for uh, the entire defense when we do that. Um, and this ego thing uh, is something that players have to understand cannot be a part of defensive, uh, defensive play. One of the things that we do with our guys is to reassure them that uh, in the course of the game that people are going to get by you. Even if you are just an outstanding player on defense, there are going to be offensive players who are outstanding in their part of the game, and they can get by you. And so uh, the important thing to remember is that uh, do not be concerned about somebody getting by you because uh, basketball <coughs> is played five on one. Now, most people don't really think about it that way, but that's exactly how it's played. There are five people on your team, and if somebody gets by you, it is your teammate's responsibility, either one, two, or many, uh, to stop that penetration, to help you stop it. And so uh, we call, any time a player can get between you and another player, that's called a seam or a gap. And any time that the offensive player can get in and through that gap, they're going to be able to get to the, to the basket. And so uh, players have to support each other, and that's really important for you to do as a help defender. Uh, let's say that somebody uh, looks like they're going to get by your teammate, uh, then it's important for you to step in and uh, close the door on that scene. Too many times players do this. Uh, they see that player uh, starting to get into the seam, and instead of getting their body over in front and stopping it so that they have to either pick up the ball or run over you, uh, that we begin to reach into that space. And when we reach into that space, that's going to usually end up in a reaching foul on that person. Yeah, and, you know, like the biggest problem with defense that I usually see is that people play defense with their arms or hands. Yeah. And, sure. you know, defense is mostly about body positioning and, and footwork um, and shutting down, like, uh, passing lanes and shutting down lanes of, of driving and things like that. Right. If you're too busy playing the traffic cop defense, that's where you get you know, tons of fouls to call and get beat real easily. Right, right. And so this, this support uh, for each other is really important in a team defensive scheme so that they can't get to the basket. Yeah. The, the best they're going to be able to do is hopefully uh, shoot from the perimeter. Okay, so one of the things that, that I wanted to underline with everybody is this, is that the ego of not wanting to be beat uh, defensively is something you have to let go of. And, and so what do you do? 
Well, well largely, that, that's the thing, too. I mean, okay. with any anything about, uh, you know, getting beat or making a mistake or anything, people need to learn that in basketball, that, that stuff's just going to happen, and, you know, it's no big deal. It, that's it, right. It'll happen, but, you know, the next time down the floor, it's a new, uh, you know, reset, and even if it does happen, you should have your teammates there to help you out and stuff like that. Right, and it's not a big deal if you get beat. I mean, uh, that's just not that big a deal. However... The thing that we want to do and to counteract all of that is this. Uh, one of the most important things in individual defense is to have ball pressure. And what that means is that you're going to get up into that person who has the basketball uh, close enough that you could touch their chest with your fingers. And even closer if you figure you've got enough quickness to do that. Um, and this really has a, 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 an effect on the defensive players that uh, is really what you want. Number one, they want to have now protect the basketball. And if you are playing off of them, they can take a look over you and select what it is that they're going to do. But once you create pressure by moving in tighter against them and having a good basketball stance and not reaching for the basketball necessarily, but just really being very active and staying close, then you can force them into uh, making mistakes. Here's the other thing is that um, we really want, to, if we can, when we get players toward the sideline, we want to pin them on the sideline. Do not allow them to come over the top, which means uh, that they're coming toward the elbows uh, of the key um, on their attack, but instead pin them along the sideline so they can't do that. The only way they can go is toward the midcourt line, or they can go to the baseline side. We'll kind of talk about that in just a minute, too. But it's important for you to not allow them into the middle. Yeah, and the thing, too, about the getting them up against the sideline or the baseline or whatever is that you're adding an extra defender by doing that. Absolutely. One of the things that people don't really think about is that those boundaries, whether it's sideline, midcourt, or whatever, if you can get a player up against that, that's just like having a, a sixth or seventh man on your team. And so... Uh, that's why they, they traps in the corners uh, in zone presses so much. Yeah. And, and so that's really important. So uh, one of the things we want to do then is to make sure that we create pressure on the basketball. Now, we happen to have had a really good group at our high school the last couple of years who understood all of that and played, uh, played, to that, played that way. Um, we had pressure on the ball out front, and, you know, oftentimes players – will not really even pick anybody up until they get to the three-point line. But when they get to the three-point line, it's too late. And so we pick them up uh, either at the mid-court line, or if we want to apply a little bit more pressure, we'll move into the back court to pick them up. And we make that uh, person with the basketball uh, make two or three turns uh, and just keeping him busy. Uh, and we're looking for little deflections in there if we can. Deflections meaning that you've got a hand or fingers on, a, on the ball on a dribble, on a pass, and those turn into turnovers for you to take advantage of, maybe get a fast break. So ball pressure. The person who has that basketball cannot rest easy. You're right up in his space and, and making it really difficult for them to pass this into uh, other people. In a, and one, uh, a person came back to me this year uh, about a team that we played uh, locally, and the word had gotten back to him through some other people that they really struggled with, with our defense because uh, we forced them out of their offensive sets. We didn't let them do what they wanted to do. And so when the offensive, uh, you know, your offensive play structure starts to break down, then you're not very effective. And so you get a little panicky and you start to throw bad passes. And so that pressure on defense is so important. Now, you cannot create that pressure if you're worried about your ego and whether you're going to get beat by a guy with a basketball. You're going to get beat from time to time, and you live with that, but understanding that pressure is so, so important. Okay, so just a couple of other thoughts that are really important, too, is that uh, I think I mentioned this a while ago, we don't want the ball in the middle, in the lane, because when people get into the lane, then it is harder to control them, and usually that results in one of two things. It results in a foul by the defense or a score by the offense, and if they get a foul on us, it usually is a shooting foul uh, on the defense of the shooting foul, 
And so they get a chance to go to the free throw line and maybe get two shots or an and one. So we want to keep them out of the middle. Um, Let's see, there are a couple other things maybe I wanted to touch on, Casey, but I've forgotten now exactly. Yeah, but, you know, I think one of the major things, though, that you were talking about is the ego thing because, you know, a lot of times people, they just get so caught up in thinking about the mistakes they haven't even made yet. And, you know, it's like, why sabotage yourself by doing that? And, you know, you can, you can tell the guys that have problems in their games are the guys that are doing that, especially, like, with shooting and, you know, playing tough defense. It's like if you are in your head and you're thinking about the stuff that you haven't even done yet that's going to, you know, bring you down, I mean, you, you're going to just start doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, you know, one of those self-perpetuating cycles. So you need to, like, really just play in the moment, be very present, and, you know, forget about all the other stuff. And, you know, if you're, if you're playing good defense, your teammates are there to help out, I mean, you're going to be doing the best you can do anyways. So. Right. Um, you know, taking advantage of the defense, too, or um, of the offense, and, uh, by forcing them to play with maybe a weak hand, that's really important to do. And if you can imagine this, if they're going to their left-hand side, and you've got them pinned over on the left hand side, that cuts off passes, immediate passes, to the back side of the offense. And so you kind of contain everything in that half of the, the uh, court when that happens, if you can get them to turn their back a little bit. And once they pick up the dribble, uh, that is the next element of defense that is really, really important. Um, and we call this by a couple of names. Um, well, let's not get too deep into it. But. Well, uh, let, give me another moment here. But one of the things that we do is they pick up the dribble and we immediately close out into what we call a belly up position. And a belly up position means that you're going to be belly button to belly button with them and your arms are going to be extended and they're following the basketball. We're looking to get some little piece, some little deflection of the basketball. Once again, that's pressure. And uh, some teams break down to that pressure very easily. And we have a video on that too. We do. We do. It's uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's something about the belly up and mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Tough, yeah, tough right. defense with the belly up and mirror, something right. like that. Right. Um, but that's one that you know that video doesn't have as many views as it should, because people, you know, if they knew that, knew about that, then it would be real tough on the other people they're playing against. Yeah. One of the things too is that uh, too often uh, players do not concern themselves a whole lot with defense. But you know, when you stop and go back and and, and look at things. Defense really is super important because if you can control a team and give them 46 points and you make 47 to 50 points, you're going to beat them. But if you give them 54, 64 because you don't defend very well, then you're, you're probably not going to win as many games as you're going to lose. Yeah. Okay, so those are just some thoughts that we had on defense, and hopefully those are things that will help you guys. Okay, so now that we uh... – we're going to open it up to questions from you guys. The best place for you guys to answer or get your question answered is to send it to us on Twitter. We are at Shot Science. Those are the ones we're going to do uh, give priority to because it's the easiest place for us to find them. Uh, just tweet at us, at Shot Science, and whatever your question is. Uh, we usually get to every single one of those. Um, we will also try to answer everything on Facebook and Google+. Plus. And we'll try to get to the chat questions as well, but that can get kind of crazy near the end when we get a lot of questions. But uh, definitely send us your questions on Twitter, and we will do our best to get to you. I want to also ask that you guys please uh, post on your Facebook or Google Plus page that we're doing this live show and tell your friends so that we can get more people to show up. That would be great um, because the more people we have, obviously the more fun it is, and, and uh, you know, it just helps spread the word. Okay, so we're going to get into our first question round, and we will go to the chat now just because uh, there's a few questions there already. Um, this one is from Andreas Estonius. He says, stationary or in-game like dribbling drills? Um, not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, are you asking for examples of those things, or are you asking whether you should do one or the other? Um, if you're looking for examples on those, you can find those in our videos if you take a look at them, Andres. Yeah, and you know the thing is, is that you want to be able to do both. The yeah. stationary drills really will help you dial in uh, your mechanics and stuff, and you can kind of focus on uh, what you're doing. And then, as with any kind of uh, basketball skill or probably any sports skill, you want to you want to work on those things, but then 
put them into game speed, game intensity type of training drills. Right. Because if you just do the stationary drills or the ones where you're not doing too much, then you try to put that into your game uh, experience, and then it's just kind of it doesn't translate. So you want to make sure that you're you're doing both and graduating to each as you go along. Um, Andres also asks, how long are the vertical jump program workouts? People ask us this all the time, but it really depends on the person. Uh, it's probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half, um, but it really depends on the person. It could be an hour if you're really cranking through it. Um, the thing is, is that you want to remember to limit your, your rest period times or the periods between when you do a set and then start another set. Uh, the best thing to do is to keep that at about a minute uh, max. If you're, if you're waiting too long in between the sets, then you're not going to get the full experience and you, know, you want to get back into it before you're able to fully recover uh, from the set before. So make sure that you're getting in there and doing it. Uh, you know, minute break max. If you're able to do it after 30 seconds, that's, that's even better. Um, One of the things you'll find, too, is that if you're working hard enough, you'll be exhausted when you get finished with that workout, too. Okay, here's one from uh, at TJ B-Ball for Life, whose name is TJ. Um, they ask, do you have any tips on shin splints? Um, first, we will say we are not doctors, so we can't give you any kind of, like, medical advice or anything like that. But, um, I mean, mostly it's probably just rest and recovery. You know, shin splints are, are pretty typical uh, when you first start a, um, uh, an activity, uh, whether it be track, basketball, or whatever. And what it is is a slight tearing of the muscle tissue along your shin bone, and usually that takes about uh, a week or two for you to kind of a rest for that to kind of heal and take care of itself. And then you have to kind of work your way through it. But shin splints are, um, are really, they're so painful. And so probably the best thing you have to do is just rest. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing, too, I would say is uh, get some flexibility and stretching and things going, too, yeah. because that always helps with uh, any kind of uh, training soreness and, and fatigue and stuff like that. Right. Is Most people aren't flexible, nearly flexible enough. And that's, that's why... When we, we have people do the vertical jump program and they start using the handbook and stuff and they find that they get like these huge jumps right in the beginning or they feel like this major jump in athleticism right in the beginning, beginning it's because of all the added flexibility that they, they probably thought that they had but they didn't really have. Right. And, you know, most people think that they're, you know, at least moderately flexible but they, they come to find out that they're not. Yes, true. And so that would be one thing to kind of address if, if you're having problems with shin splints, I think. Okay, so send us more questions on Twitter. This one is, again, from Andreas. He says, I want to work on my shot a lot in the summer, but I don't know if I have the proper shooting form, so is it worth to practice a lot with the wrong form? How do I know if I have a decent shooting form? Okay, you don't want to take and spend time uh, working on a form that maybe is not very good. And so how do you know? You can actually uh, put together a video if you want to and send it to us and we'll give you some comments on what we see, what we think you need to do. But you can also, Andres, go to our shooting playlist uh, of videos and you can see there of what uh, we think is a good, uh, are good the shooting mechanics. Fundamentals of yeah. good mechanics. Right, and the, the fundamentals that you'll see most really good players using. And so they're not unique, they're not, uh, uh, you know, earth shattering or anything else, but if you don't have very good shooting mechanics, the more you reinforce that, uh, the harder it is to change at some point uh, in your uh, career to be a better shooter. So you want to take and, and, and get the, the form right. In fact, I think I saw something when Michael Jordan said something about that recently. In fact, uh, uh, you and I were talking about it, I thought. But uh, essentially it is um, if you practice with a re uh, and practice really hard with the wrong mechanics, you end up with nothing but really strong, wrong mechanics in the end. And so uh, you really want to get it right and then go to work on it. Yeah, the thing about the mechanics and having good fundamentals and stuff is that, you know, people always say, oh, well, you know, Reggie Miller didn't shoot like that or, you know, Larry Bird or so-and-so. And it's and it's like, yeah, they didn't maybe shoot with the exact perfect fundamental form, but they probably had a longer roadblock to get over when, when they were learning to shoot because 
of having kind of those wonky mechanics. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that they just put in the time to make it so that it worked. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about having good mechanics right from the start is that you eliminate any kind of uh, hitch that you might reach when you're, you're trying to develop a good shot. And so it's the quickest point from point A to point B, and B being, you know, uh, good shooting. Um, so, you know, of course, you're going to be able to find any example of good shooter that has really crappy form. Yeah, sure. but, but the thing is, is that why set yourself up with that kind of, uh, you know, hitch in the beginning right. when you don't need to? Yeah, you know, we often get comments like this. I answered one of these questions earlier today. Uh, somebody wants to shoot like Ray Allen. Well, my comment is, is on, on this is, is because they're good role models. Well, maybe they are, but the thing that's really more important is developing uh, uh, elements of your shot that are going to work for you. You want to develop your shot. Not everybody's got the range of motion. Not everybody's got the same strength. And so by saying that you're going to shoot like Michael Jordan or somebody else uh, and use that as a role model, I don't think that's really good. What I think is to find uh, the proper shooting mechanics, uh, which most really good shooters have, and learn about all of that, and then create your shot, and uh, you'll probably be an awful lot more successful. Yeah, I mean, um, you, it's like you're you're the uh, it, it's your shot. It's not somebody else's. Yeah, I mean, shooting is like a formula, and you know you have to have the pieces to fit into the formula. Right. And if you're trying to take the pieces that Ray Allen uses, I mean, he's you know six foot six, super athletic. Um, you know, that may, may have longer arms, may have longer torso. I mean, there's so many different factors that factor into it. And if you try to cram those into your formula, that might not necessarily work. Well, and there's another element there, too, is that most of those guys that are playing uh, on higher levels of basketball, professional basketball, uh, college basketball, those guys have gone through uh, their physical maturity and they're a lot stronger in the upper body than most younger players. And so uh, they're able to accomplish a lot of things that guys who are 14, 16, 18 aren't able to do just because of that strength factor. You imagine just how strong Dwight Howard is, um, you know, not that he's a great shooter because he's not, but he's got all of that power in that upper body that he could use. Or, uh, and, you know, most young players don't have that. And so they have to accommodate that uh, by getting their legs into it a lot more. So anyway. So yeah, yeah, well, I mean, okay. People need to, 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 you don't want to emulate anybody's one person's shooting. You want to take the fundamentals. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we probably, that would be a retread if I went all over that. But, okay. um, yeah, I mean, you don't, you want to shoot for yourself and what mechanics work best for you. Just make sure, uh, I think he was talking about his shooting form and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Another way to do that is definitely film yourself and look at it yourself to make sure that you look like you're shooting the correct, uh, with the correct mechanics and stuff. Exactly. Um, then, I mean, you can send it to us and, you know, if you want to upload it to YouTube and then post it on our Facebook page, we can take a look and help you with it. But you really want to be a good coach for yourself because if you're not able to look at your shot and say, oh, well, you know, uh, my, my body is starting to kind of drift over to the side or my elbow is kind of starting to flare out a little bit too much or my, my assist hand is becoming too involved, um, then, you know, how are you ever going to know? You're just going to, you know, just go out there and shoot a bunch and then realize later that, oh, well, I was doing this the whole time. Yeah. You want to be able to assess those things on the fly. So you want to be a good self-coach when you're doing that stuff. Well, that's one of the approaches that we take when we teach people how to shoot the basketball. In fact, that's how we begin. I just tell them, okay, this is, this is where we're going to go. We're going to take and show you exactly how to do this and all the things that will give you cues about what's going good or what isn't going good so that you can make those changes yourself. Because there's going to be some time in the future when you're going to need some help and you're not going to have me or another shooting coach who's around who can really help you with it. But if you already have the answers to some of those questions, you'll be able to figure out yourself what the problems are, and like Casey said, and fix them. Yeah, okay. And here's two videos that you should watch. The first one is called Fix Your Shot, and that's one that where we essentially show you the results of shooting and 
and what went wrong and how to fix them. And that should help teach you to kind of pick those things out too. So Fix Your Shot is a good video to check out. The next one that you should check out is the Form Shooting Drill. Yes. Um, that one is one where um, it, it kind of it forces you to really focus on your mechanics and, um, you know, if, if here's how you want to do it, too. You want to start real close to the basket. One of the major problems people have when they're trying to shoot or get their mechanics dialed in is that they're, they're so excited that they go and they run back behind the three-point line, and they're practicing their mechanics from there, and it's like, well, you know, that's, that's like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, trying to throw a baseball from the that far outfield, and you've never done it before, and you're trying to hit right to, you know, home plate or something else. You need to make sure that you're working very close in, like right from you know the five feet away, and really focusing on getting the correct release and stuff like that. And then as as you master that, you step back and you work on you know just incrementally stepping back. You don't want to just start out super deep or anything like that. Right. So, fix your shot and the form shooting drill. Form shooting drill is something that that you should do every day until you feel your shot is really starting to come along, and then you kind of cut back on it. Uh, usually as an assignment for my students between one uh, a lesson one week for the next is to make not shoot but make 500 shots using that form shooting drill yeah. and the whole the whole idea of form shooting is developing form and that includes uh, the hand the wrist the feet uh, everything yeah and you know there was a guy on Twitter the other day that was saying um, that you know he wanted to work on his shot and that he was putting a bunch of time in to you know, work on it. And then he said that he was shooting like 150 shots or something like that. And, you know, I, I just don't think that's enough, really, to, no. to, to get, dial it all in. I mean, you need to really be up in the couple, few hundred makes to really dial in your shot. Right, and you'll be surprised after the end of a week and then two weeks how much your shot improves. I mean, it's just crazy how much it improves over that uh, period of time using that form shooting drill and getting a lot of uh, uh, repetitions, made repetitions. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so I want to remind you guys that if you want to get your question answered, Twitter is the best place. I don't think we've had this few Twitter questions before, so if you really want to get your question answered, that is the best place, um, at Shot Science. Um, let's see, uh, you know, we're going to try to get to the chat questions and stuff too, but make sure you're sending us, uh, at Shot Science on Twitter. This one is from TJ again, uh, at TJ B-Ball for Life on Twitter. Uh, they say, what are good stretches for after practice? Um, I would say check out the, uh, vertical jump videos that we have out and look at the dynamic stretching package right. that's in, uh, part of that. Because if you, if you look at that, one of the big things for us is that static stretches aren't really the best, especially if you're using uh, them as like a warm-up. Um, because if you're doing like a dynamic stretch, you're actually moving the muscle through that movement pattern, and uh, it's not just like you're, you're just tugging on the muscle or whatever. Right. So uh, check out the dynamic stretching package in the vertical jump videos, and there's like a whole bunch of stuff in there that... Uh, that are they're they're also kind of more fun than just the static stretches too. So right, I think I think there are four of those vertical jump videos that they. And I don't there's know two, there's two major ones, and th that's yeah. where they are. I one is, in, is in the number one. So check those out. Okay, so here's one from Ian Skinmer at Ian underscore Skinmer on Twitter. He says, "I did the form shooting daily for a month. My shot was pure. I got called splash." I stopped doing the drills, now I miss. Okay, well, that, that kind of goes back to what I just spoke about just a couple of minutes ago, and that, that is you want to take and get that, that uh, shot dialed in, and then what you want to do is do that form shooting drill at least two or three times a week. Now, two or three times a week uh, means this, is that maybe you do, if you, if you follow that uh, uh, drill, it gives you five markers to shoot from. And when you take and go all the way around from one block to the other and return to your starting point, that's nine blocks. So that would be 90 makes. And you do that three, four times a week uh, and, you know, spread it out so you're not doing them, th uh, you know, days in a row, but maybe skip a day or two. You'll be surprised at how, how um, your shot will really kind of maintain itself. 
This is just like anything that you learn how to do. If you don't use it and you leave it lay for a week or two and then go back to it, uh, you're not going to be nearly as good with it. So uh, having the form shooting drill got you aces, no question. Sounds like you're, you're happy with that. But then when you, uh, uh, you left that, uh, then that practice was gone. You need to go back and touch on that again uh, fairly regularly, maybe two, three times a week. Yeah, I mean, the more consistent you are with your shooting practice, the more consistent your shooting is going to be when you really want it to be there, like in games and stuff. Um, and Splash, is that, that's a great nickname for you. Yeah, and he, said, great. he also he just sent another one that says, uh, how long should this drill be done? Um, the uh, form shooting drill, it's not a time period. What you need to do is, is uh, go through each one of those five locations and shoot until you make 10 at a location, and then you can move up to the next one, and, and then 10 there and move on, so that when you finish, you've made 90 makes. Now, to make those 90 shots, you might shoot 120. Uh, you'd be surprised, though, when you get going and, and all of it's feeling really good for you, that you might do that, uh, make 90, and maybe only be 110 shots, something like that. You'd be surprised. Yeah, and the other thing is, too, is that you got to be a good judge of how many shots that you need to be taking. Uh, is your shooting where you want it to be? If it's not, then that probably means that you need to spend more time doing it. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, you want to have a good diversity of, of the shooting drills and stuff that you're doing. You want to do the form shooting to really dial in your mechanics and get things kind of clicking where you want them to be. Right. Then you want to move on to game speed practice and make sure that you're getting uh, you know, lots of repetitions off uh, catch and shoot, off uh, shooting off the dribble, um, you know, maybe coming off screens and catch and shoot. I mean, all stuff where... You know, it's it's kind of like game intensity training, right? So you want to have a good mix of that stuff. Okay, so hit us up on Twitter, you guys at Shot Science. This one is from Andreas again in the chat. He says, "What are the requirements for NCAA D1 in Europe? Uh, what are like the academic requirements?" You know, um, we don't have to have those committed to memory, Andreas. But if you will go on the net and go to uh, NCAA um, athletics, you can actually look up the requirements uh, that... Um, you should be able to just Google it, probably. Well, you might be able to just Google it, but uh, you, you can look up all the requirements, and they've changed over the last couple of years, and they actually are greater now than they used to be. I think they changed them most recently, maybe three years ago. So. Um, you can find out what you would need to, need from there. Now, I don't know how that would translate uh, to schools out of the United States. I haven't got any idea. So that's something you might want to get some input from. And you can actually contact the NCAA itself and um, probably talk with somebody there uh, or send an email, and they can actually get back to you and give you that information. That's the NCAA. Yeah, or, you know, if there's a coach that, that's interested in you, too, I mean, they, they're going to be able to tell you what the, what the right. deal is, too. Right. Um, one thing that, or I think maybe two things that I will say is that, um, number one, you should be really focused on your academics no matter what if you're a high school basketball player. Um, the thing is, is that they, if you have good grades, they will take you further than even your basketball abilities will. And if you're a good basketball player on top of that, then that will just help you even more. I mean, schools are going to want you if you're a good basketball player and a good, <coughs> a good student. So, I mean, that should be a major focus. People think that they can just ride through on their basketball ability, and that's just not the case. Um, there's more opportunity for academic scholarships, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just important in life anyway. So really focus on that. Um, and the other thing I was just going to say was that if you're really interested in, in uh, kind of like how to get in contact with coaches or the, the kind of chain of, of uh, I don't know, recruitment or whatever, go check out our video that we did two weeks ago, our live show with Coach Bramlett. Um, I think it's overtime number 23 because that was like essentially the, the, the topic that we discussed most of the time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so check that out for sure. 
Yes, okay. So, uh, well, one more thought on that. Yeah. One of the things that they, they call that, that uh, NCAA uh, requirements, they call it qualifying requirements. And um, if you are a, a Division I caliber player and you do not meet those minimum requirements, they can't give you a scholarship. And so the educational element uh, to all of that is really important for you to understand and get on it early. Um, I was talking to a guy yesterday who was a local coach, and he was telling about somebody he knew who wanted to play in Division I and questionable whether that was really, uh, you know, if he was that good or not, but he couldn't get, he couldn't get uh, in any way because he was not a qualifier. He, he didn't meet those minimum requirements. So that's real important for everybody, not just people who are out of the country to be concerned about. Right. Um, and TJ just asked another question on Twitter saying, uh, how can I prepare myself going to a D1 school to play basketball? Um, I would say check out that video that we did with Coach Bramlett because that, that will give you more information. Uh, if you have anything specific, um, you can ask us again, um, or you can you can go in on the Coach Bob's Facebook page and ask him. He would be a really good person to ask. Yeah, that's West Valley Basketball Club. And yeah, and we linked that in that video too. So right. so and make sure you check that out if you want to ask him yeah. directly. And, and Bob's really knowledgeable about all of that too. Yeah, and just say you're from Team Shot Science, and he'll probably be right on it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's go back to the chat. This one is from Blasco Angel. They say, "How can I get faster and make good decisions?" Making good decisions is mostly about experience. Yes. Um, you know, the thing is, is that you you want. You don't want to really be sitting there pondering the decisions that you're going to make when you're playing uh, basketball. You just want them to be second nature. The only way that really comes about is just by instinct, and that kind of is built up through playing experience and being in those situations right. before and stuff. Very true, very true. Um, getting faster. Well, you know, um, I'm not sure how old you might be right now, but, you know... <clears throat> Every male and female, as they are going through their teenage years, uh, they are maturing physically, and uh, you're going to be a lot faster probably as a senior than you were when you were a freshman just because of the development of strength and, and that kind of thing, coordination. Uh, but things that can help you get faster, uh, actually, do we still have those videos from... Um, the development of speed, I can't remember. Yep, I mean, they're on Chase's uh, second channel. Um, you so if you, guys, if you guys go to youtube.com slash Chase Curtis, C-H-A-S-E-C-U-R-T-I-S-S, -S, there is maybe three or four, maybe more than that, short videos on athleticism and building up your speed and conditioning and things like that. And acceleration. And acceleration. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing probably is just uh, using, I don't know, I mean, getting faster is tough, but what will really help you is footwork. Um, so doing things where you're concentrating on developing your footwork will really help. So stuff like ladder drills, jump rope is one of your big things. Mm -hmm. um, dot drills. Dot drills is really good. Um, anything where you're doing changes in direction, so plant and push footwork. Plant and push footwork is really big in, in all of like the dribble drills and stuff that we have, or the dribble moves. Um, so essentially, what you're doing is you're you're planting your outside foot and you're exploding off of that foot into a new direction, and that will help you build up kind of that lateral changes in speed and things like that, which is really important in basketball. Um, but anything explosive like that, running suicides are good. Well, you know something that I like to always kind of throw in here when we're, we're talking about speed and acceleration uh, and explosion, you know, our vertical jump program with the stretching and uh, uh, the plyometrics and all that kind of stuff is surprisingly effective in developing uh, speed and quickness too. So that, that would be another thing to, uh, to look at. Yeah, I mean, the vertical jump program is really, it's not just an exclusive vertical jump kind of th focus. It's kind of like a, a full treatment for athleticism. So uh, a lot of those things are going to kind of apply in different areas of, of just all around athleticism. Right. It's not just vertical jump. I mean, it, it's right. explosion, quickness, acceleration, acceleration all those things. Okay. Um, 
I want to remind you guys, please send us Twitter questions. We have never gotten this few Twitter questions, but this is where we answer the most questions is, is on Twitter. Just at Shot Science, whatever you want to talk to us about. Um, okay, this one is from TJ again. Uh, they say, how can I play aggressive defense without fouling? Okay, uh, that's kind of what we were talking about a little earlier is, is that um, – being aggressive on defense is applying pressure, and most of the most of the defensive calls that you get against you are using your hands uh, and arms, and and so you want to learn. If you take and go to our videos on on uh, how to use your hands and and feet and whatnot, that'll help you a lot. But uh, reaching in typically is the problem that gets you in trouble on defense. Now, does that mean you never reach in? No, that doesn't mean that because sometimes it's very effective to do that. When you are going to use your hands, the best way to use your hands are from the underneath side. When, and officials very seldom ever call officials or, or uh, uh, hands uh, uh, contact fouls when the hand is coming from the underneath side. Do not know why, but that's pretty difficult. I think it's just because it doesn't look as, as violent. You know, if I'm coming down, I boom like that. That yeah. looks like a felony. But if I'm just popping up, I mean, it doesn't look like very much. Right. And and using your hands to get uh, deflections, you don't necessarily have to get steals. This is a point that we made a few weeks back: is that colleges are really starting to chart. Uh, deflections. In other words, you just get a hand on the ball and it's deflected and one of your teammates is able to pick it up and you take off on the fast break. So deflections uh, are really important. But when you start reaching around people and you start reaching into their space with your hands, that's when you get into trouble. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn to anticipate dribbles and, and stuff like that. But uh, hands and arms usually are what gets you in trouble on defense. Yeah, and you know, the be we talked about it earlier too. The best thing to really have dialed in for your defense is good footwork. And you, you should really think about using your feet and your essentially your lower body and stuff to kind of cut off the, the, guy, the ball handler's attacks to the lane. Because yeah. if you're able to do that, he can't just plow over you. Exactly. And so if you're able to use your feet and stuff to shut down any of his attacks, then you know he, he's going to get really frustrated and you'll, you'll just essentially take him out of the game and you don't need to reach in and get fouls called or anything. So really work on your feet and if you want to be an aggressive defender, being able to use your, your lower body and your feet to really kind of corral a guy is the best way to really put pressure on him. Right. I was reading something earlier today from Kevin Eastman who happens to be one of the uh, coaches of the Boston Celtics. He's an assistant coach there. And he has a blog that uh, we follow pretty closely. And one of the things that he was saying there is that uh, regarding defense is that it's very important for you to get a low center of gravity on defense and that f uh, you're able to actually use your feet better when you get lower. Uh, the other thing that's real important is uh, use what is called a step drag uh, kind of footwork, and I we talked about that in our video. Yeah, defense one hundred and one. Uh, right, and step drag uh, it really is important for you to be able to uh, stay in front of the person. And the other thing is that with the the feet that's important is do not allow the feet to come together uh, when you're moving defensively. What happens when your feet come okay, together? We'll, we'll show this again. What happens when you do that is that your body tends to become more upright. And where you want to stay low with a wide base, so yeah. So, uh, so here, here's like where you would be if you're in a defensive stance or whatever. And if you're going to step drag, you're going to step drag like that. And obviously, you can get pretty quick at it. But yeah. What you don't want to do is this: is where you step, come together. Because look, I've already stood up straight. Now I'm off balance, and then I have to also step down to, to do it again. Yeah. So you never want those to get more than you know a foot or so apart. And it was Eastman's uh, uh, comment that, you know, uh, defense is really about how you use your feet more than anything else. Right. I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. I, I know that when we used to go to basketball camps and, and it would be with all the uh, college coaches and stuff, like getting down to your stance and using your feet was like a huge thing. Yeah. And if you were playing the thing where you're just swinging your arms in there, they were not happy about that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> there was one more thing I was going to say. Well, what was I going to say? There was something I was going to throw out there and I forgot too. Um, oh boy, it was good too. <laughs> oh, here's here's the thought that was on my mind. 
sometimes it's really difficult when the person is driving for you to maintain a good defensive position with them <clears throat> by using that step drag footwork. And so we kind of have this rule is that at some point you maybe have to have to turn and run with that person. Uh, because when you're using that running step like they are when they're dribbling, then oftentimes you can stay up with them or you can get into a position where you can get in front and reestablish your defensive location. So uh, that's something. It's usually shuffle, shuffle, turn and run, reestablish. Shuffle, shuffle, turn and run, reestablish. Very important for you to be able to control people defensively, and sometimes it's just through turning your body and running, just outrun them. Yeah. I can't remember what I was going to say, but I, one of the things that just popped in my mind was, especially after watching a lot of the NBA games and stuff, is that a lot of players at all levels play flat-footed, straight-legged defense, even when, you know, even if, even if their guy doesn't have the ball, you know, the ball is on the offside or whatever. That is the worst thing you can do. You always want to be prepared have you know the bend in your knee and be up on the balls of your feet because if you're if you're doing that you don't have to go through the process of unlocking all your joints and getting ready to go. I mean that's that's like one of the things that'll slow you down the most. So playing you know uh, good defense down in the stance pretty much all the time is really how you're going to uh, you know make yourself quicker on defense. I think you know, and be in position to get a steal or shut down some other guy's drive or whatever. Uh, you just got to be prepared. Flat-footed defense freaks me out. <laughs> okay, this is from King Simons or Simmons on Twitter at King D three Trey. They say, "Hey, shot science, how important are shoes when it comes to basketball? With three hundred dollar Jordans, give me better results than sixty dollar non popular <laughs> shoes." Well, are you, you trolling us? If you <laughs> if you buy those three hundred dollar shoes, there's no question you'll be able to dunk anytime you want. That's tongue in cheek, of course. You know, we have. I, I think I, I say this every time this comes up, yeah. but the the it will help you jump higher because your wallet will be lighter. <laughs> but other than that, it is it's not it. It's no. mostly bells and whistles, and you're paying for that athlete's uh, new pool or something. Uh, yeah. The, the, what you really want to do when you're looking at shoes is getting ones that feel good, feel comfortable, and will support you for you know three to four months, yeah. and then get a new pair. I mean, if you're buying $300 shoes as opposed to these $60 ones, and they're just as good, uh, you could buy a couple of those $60 shoes and probably be better off because shoes break down really fast, and, you know, the, the $300 ones aren't better made necessarily than the ones that cost $60, $80, $90. They're just styling. Uh, you know, um, I think we talked about this in the past, too. Chase uh, used to... Uh, when he was going to college, they would evaluate shoes from, and we're not going to talk about any of the types of shoes, but what the uh, results of it were essentially is this, is that most, uh, most athletic shoes will last you about uh, six to eight weeks, and then they are, they're really starting to break down sufficiently that you, you shouldn't even use them anymore. So uh, that should be a good guide. Uh, buying $300 shoes uh, does not make any sense to me at all. Uh, like Casey said, uh, you're just really uh, putting money in the wallets of those guys that get their name on them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you will definitely find shoes in the 60 to $90 range that are really good, really supportive, and will do all the things that the $300 ones will do, and you'll be able to get a new pair sooner that will you know, make sure that you're always having good support in your shoes. So. Three hundred dollars shoes that that scares me. Well, you'll feel that when the and when the shoes are starting to break down too. Um, yeah. Okay. And here here's the last thing we'll say on it. No shoe or any other piece of equipment is going to make you a better player. Right. I mean, you 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 you're not going to buy an arm sleeve or a headband or a pair of shoes or anything like that. A shooting and then, glove. Yeah. Or t and turn into the next LeBron James. All that stuff comes from hard work. There's no contraption or, you know, pieces of clothing that will do that for you. Yeah. Okay. This one is from Dame, at Dame Petro, Petro, Petrovsky on Twitter. Uh, they say, shot science. In practice, I dribble the ball well, but when I play in a game or a pickup game, I kind of freeze and don't know what to do. Help me. Okay. Uh, that's all just a matter of experience. You know, we... we 
we kind of, when we're not very experienced and we play in games with other people who we perceive to be better than us, we are afraid that we might take and screw up and that everybody will be uh, giving us the hoo-ha over that. And so one of the things that happens is that you have to expect that when you play, you're going to take and make mistakes. And you, and you just forget about them and go on. You learn from them, but you just forget about them. And, you know, a, a, a line that I use all the time, and, that, and I, I have on this program a number of times, and that is this, is that um, you don't want to be afraid of making mistakes because if you do, you make more mistakes, more mistakes, and more mistakes. What you want to do is, is just let go of the fear and make the mistake because you're going to learn from them. And so uh, that's, the, that's the reason why we perform so poorly in those kind of settings is we're afraid, fear, that we're going to screw up. Yeah, I mean, the best players out there, regardless of how good they actually are, have the shortest memory when it comes oh, to yeah. stuff like screwing up or thinking ahead too far. Yeah. They just they play in the moment, and if they screw up, no big deal, they move on. Yeah. And, you know, if you get in your head, that's when you really start to freeze and self-sabotage. So you need to make sure that you're, you're not doing that. And, you know, keep in mind that people, and I think Michael Jordan even said it, was that, you know, he's, he's failed more times than probably anybody to get to the point where he is exactly. now. So, uh, you know, I mean, everybody is going to fail way more times than they succeed. And you learn from that failure, too. Uh, um or you're not going to be around very long. That's just the nature of things, you know. You threw a bad pass, well, you, and in your mind, you're trying to figure out, well, why was it such a bad pass? He wasn't open. I threw it to the wrong side of the body, and you learn from all that. So uh, don't be afraid, and just because you uh, maybe uh, screw up a little bit, uh, learn from it and go on. Yeah, and, you know, the, the best players, too, they also have, like, this aggressive confidence so they always know they're going to make the shot. They always know they're going to make the pass. They always know they're going to beat the guy. They always know they're going to steal the ball. They always know that they're going to shut the guy down on defense. They always know they're going to win. Even though they might not do that in the end, they just know that that's what's going to happen. They're not taking a shot going, oh, man, I hope that goes in. They're going, yep, money every single time, even though it doesn't go in every single time. And, and but it's that, just that mindset. And that all comes all from experience. Yeah. But, but it, I think also, too, it comes from experience, but it also comes from letting go of all that other stuff yeah. and just changing your mentality to know that, number one, it's not going on your permanent record, so it doesn't matter <laughs> and three no minutes from now. <laughs> yeah, so just letting go of that stuff and just going for it. I mean, yeah. it's really a big deal. You gotta, if, you don't have, if you don't put any risk in, then you're not going to get any reward. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, this one is from TJ again. They said, he says, uh, why do some players go into shooting slumps? You know, um, that's an interesting question. And, and my take on it is this, is that sometimes we get really kind of a little lackadaisical, a little sloppy about what it is that we are doing with our mechanics. And this is one of the reasons why I think the form shooting drill is effective for you to do uh, you know, two or three times a week just to stay sharp. But we, we get some little tick in our shot, um, some little change in our shot that we're not really totally aware of that affects the accuracy uh, and effectiveness of it. And so um, once you kind of under, this is one of the reasons I like to teach people this way, that you understand what you've got to do, you understand how to fix it, um, and all of those things are really important. You know, one of the things that we talk about in shooting is, okay, uh, the results of a flat arc usually is going to be a long rebound. So that if you shoot the ball and you see a long rebound, oh, okay, I know the things that create long rebounds like that, and so I'm going to fix those. But the, the elements just kind of get a little sloppy. And so uh, the thing to do it is to stay on the uh, uh, form shooting drill two or three times a week. And I think, I think a little bit of it, too, is mental, too. Uh, uh, yeah. Because if, if a player is in their head and all of a sudden they start second-guessing themselves yeah. Yeah. or they're, they're, maybe they, they haven't been working on their shooting for, yes. very, for like maybe a few days and yeah. then suddenly they're feeling like, oh, man, you know, my, my, uh, my arm is going to flare. They're thinking about all these mechanical things while they're shooting. Yes. All of a sudden your form just breaks down because you're not focusing in on just, okay, this shot's going in, I'm focusing in on the nest. And that's, that's going to go, and it's like, oh, well, my elbow's wearing out, my, my feet aren't in the right place. And right. It's like you're thinking of all these other things, and all of a sudden everything just kind of 
falls in on itself. Well, and that's that's why I think the form of shooting drill is so important. You know, the other thing is that we oftentimes talk ourselves out of the shots because we we think, oh, I'm really off now. Well, uh, you probably are not off that much. Uh, and here's a little thing that we try to impart to all of our players, too, is that when sh your shooting starts to kind of uh, break down for you, uh, focus on the finish. And what that focus on the finish is all about is that you focus on the arm, wrist, and finger releases. Uh, that's usually where your problems in shooting come from, is just the stroke mechanics of the arm, wrist, and fingers. And so uh, I beat that into everybody's head, is that when your shot is failing you, focus on the finish. That means you're mentally into those mechanics that are a part of those parts of the stroke. Yeah, I mean, the less things that are going on in your head when you're shooting, the better. Yeah. Because if you're thinking of too many things, then that's when things start to really get kind of hairy. You think about those things when you're doing the form shooting drill to establish yeah, yeah. good patterns and go on from there. Yeah, because you just want it to be automatic when you're when you're playing your games. Okay, um, this one is from at Babico7. They say, hi, I need advice. I don't want to go to practice. I feel down. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that, I mean, why, why don't you want to go? Is there a reason? Um, that's, that's tough. I don't know. Yeah, it I is. I mean, if, if you want to be playing basketball, then you should kind of look forward to it. Um, maybe is there somebody that's giving you a hard time? Uh, are things not going the way that you want them to go? I mean, I, I don't know. That's a tough question, and I haven't got an answer for it either. Well, I mean, let us know if there if, – there's something else to it, and we can try to help you with that. Uh, but it's hard, it's hard for us to tell you, you know, just suck it up and go. I mean, you know, maybe that's what you need to do, but uh, maybe it's just a, a period right now where you're, you're not super into it. I don't know. Maybe just get back to us and let us know. We can try to help. And King Simmons says, uh, here, he's laughing at us and saying, okay, thanks about the shoe thing. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. So uh, if you want to get in, Twitter is the best place right at the second. Um, okay, this one is from TJ in the chat. When should you release your shot? Quick lightning round and stuff. Well, right at the uh, uh, full extension of your arm. If you're shooting a jump shot, the best thing to do is release it as you're reaching the top of your jump. If you get up there and hang, I watched a young man about a week ago, and he'd jump shot, and he'd hang there like he didn't think he was ever going to release it, short every shot. So you when, want to, when is our video? Um, release point. Release point for the jump shot, yeah. Yeah, so we go through and we show that. Yeah. Like you don't want to, you don't, there's no hanging really involved. No, no, no. As you reach the apex of your jump, you're releasing it. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, then you lose the power on, that, on your shot. You do. As soon as you reach the top, you're going to start to settle after that. Okay, this is from uh, at Dame Petrovsky again. They say, uh, I'm a really good mid-range shooter, but when I'm uh, a centimeter behind the line, my stroke changes. What should I do? Shoot more? You should practice more using your legs. Yep. Get that, your legs into it. Yeah, exactly. We have a video on that. Make the three-pointer, get your legs into it. Yeah, and the thing about going deeper into your shot is that you have to progressively do that. You don't want to just jump back to the three-point line, which it doesn't sound like you're doing, but... Uh, well, if you if you don't get those legs into it, it changes the shooting stroke, and accuracy just goes in the tank at that point. All right, here's here's at the at the follow up. He says, "No, I just feel bored. I want to play basketball with friend friends very much, but I don't want to go play basketball with my team." Well, then maybe that team isn't the team you should be playing with. I don't no, know. Maybe not. Maybe not. I, I still don't have any real solid uh, information for you on that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're not having fun doing it, then why are you doing it? I mean, yeah. you got to find something that, that, that is fun and, and feels good to do. And basketball is supposed to be fun. That's why we do it. Yeah, so maybe set up stuff with your friends or find another team or get your friends together on a team. I don't know. Yeah. Um, this one is from Lewis PC Win. In practice, I get most of my jump shots to fall, but in games, I'm struggling a little. How can I make uh, more chances – to be a higher percentage shooter? Well, uh, you take a look at the video that we have. Uh, there's actually two of them. One is uh, game speed shooting, and the other one is consistent shooting, I believe. Yep. And those two should probably help you a lot. One of the things that happens is that we practice all of, our, excuse me, all of our shooting and whatnot, and we practice it kind of a very passive 
uh, manner for the most part, and then we get into a game and we're dealing with speed, we're dealing with fatigue, we're dealing with defenders, and so that changes the program for us and really affects our shot. So you need to kind of replicate it if, if you can uh, in your practice sessions. Right, okay. This is going to, or let's see, we're going to do one more question here. <clears throat> this is from Novian Cobb in the chat, and he says, what are some good tips for post players? Okay, uh, first tip would be to go check out all of our videos. Uh, we have some really good ones, uh, like uh, sealing in the post and flashing in the post, which are really good uh, uh, you know, um, things that you should have in your game that probably you wouldn't know unless you, you saw that or had been playing for a long time. Um, they really help with footwork and getting you open to catch the ball, which is really essential in the post because if you're just standing there and not knowing how to get open or get the ball, you're never going to see the ball. Right. Um, and then check out our post-move uh, playlist on stuff down there too because I think you would say this too, is that playing in the post, you probably want to have two, maybe three go-to moves that are just automatic right. and then have the counter move for those uh, ready to go so that when you are shut down on those go-to moves, you have this counter move to go to. Yeah. So an example of that would be um, catch the ball in the post and you're going to do a, a jump hook or a sky hook. So you're going towards the middle, that's, that's, that's like a go-to move. A counter to that would be the up and under where you're going and it's looking like it's going to be a jump hook and then you step through and it's it, it, and lay it up on the basket. Right, right. <clears throat> One of the mistakes that most um, post players make is they want to have uh, 12 moves and then when they get into the game they can't remember any of them. Uh, two or three uh, go-to moves, that's where yeah, they go. Yeah, and the other thing is is that don't get into the habit of doing that backing down crap. I mean, that is that is one of the things that just irritates us the most. It is such a it, – it's it goes against what really helps you get open and, and make baskets in basketball. Uh, number one, it should be a foul against you because you're taking away the position of the guy that's playing defense on you. Number two is that if you want to score in any situation in basketball – creating space is the way to do it. Yeah. And when you're doing that bumping back and down stuff, you are not creating space. All you're doing is, is creating contact, which is actually making it so that they're easier to, making you easier to guard. Because as, as a defender, having contact lets you know where, where the guy is no matter where they're going. Creating space is the best way to score. Right. So have your go-to moves, whatever they are. And we've got a number of those go-to moves that uh, really are effective. Right, okay, so that's gonna do it for today, you guys. Make sure you're following us on uh, Twitter. We are at Shot Science. Google Plus and Facebook are good places to check out our tips and our, our funny stuff we find on basketball, uh, our announcements. Uh, to come talk to us on there. Um, also, follow us on YouTube or subscribe to us on YouTube. That's where we post all of our uh, tutorials and stuff like that and our tips uh, in video form. So make sure you're following us there. Um, we're going to go watch the playoff games, I guess, later. And uh, let us know what you guys think the uh, playoffs are going to pan out like down in the chat. Uh, do you think it's going to be the Pacers, the Heat, Spurs, uh, or Memphis that are probably not Memphis, but <laughs> uh, let us know what you guys think is going to happen in the playoffs. Um, do you have anything else that you want to say? I just want to shout out to Awesome Cohen. He's uh, uh, throwing some nice words our way. Uh, he looks forward to this little uh, uh, show every Sunday, and so it could be a could, could could be a girl. It could be, it could be. <laughs> okay, um, one way or the other. Thanks so much for your comment. We love it. Yep. Um, let's see. Make sure you guys are telling your friends and family to check out Shot Science stuff because the more you help us grow, the more we can give to you guys. Um, make sure you check out all of our videos that we mentioned in the thing. Vi the, the vertical jump video would be a good one for a lot of you guys for the questions that you were asking. Yeah. Um, we will be back next week, 1 p.m. Sunday. Uh, we'll see you guys then. Good. Thanks for showing with us, guys. Yeah, thanks for the questions.